creepy on abandoned buildings read, and making my own IRL story from the beginning. It was 2005. My city had its share of abandoned sanatoriums, some of them dating all the way back to the source time. Naturally, we picked one as our hangout spot because, well, we were punk metalheads, reckless and full of mischief. Young and cocky romantics at heart, we had a thing for drinking beer and cheap port in the weirdest places, cemeteries, empty lots, and, of course, abandoned buildings. It was the post-New Year holiday break, a glorious student season where you could waste an entire month however you wanted. So, there we were, sitting in or near the sanatorium, sipping beers, swapping scary stories, and spilling our souls. Then my friend suddenly says, You know, it feels like they're renovating this place. A week or two ago, I left the Shiraga, Technical College, and stopped by here to take a piss. I was walking down the hallway, and in one of the empty rooms, I saw someone kneeling, like they were fixing an outlet or something. He paused, looking a bit unsure. At least I think it was someone. Could have just been a pile of junk left behind by some homeless guy. But man, it freaked me out. You don't expect to run into anyone in a dead space like that, and then bam, someone is right there, messes with your head. I was feeling bold, maybe because of the beer. Alright, I said, let's go see your pile of junk. So off we went to check it out. It was late, probably around 8 or 10 p.m., and pitch dark. The January cold was biting. The walls were frosted over. Icicles hung from the ceiling, and our only light came from the dim screens of our primitive flip phones. We stepped into the abandoned building, navigating the creaky corridors, until we found the room my friend had mentioned. I tossed a candle stub inside, and sure enough, there he was, someone kneeling in the corner, perfectly still, just as my friend had described. He was dressed head to toe in black, like a security guard, or one of those wannabe military guys who's obsessed with tactical gear. The one detail I could not miss was his boots. Combat boots, sturdy, and expensive looking. The frost had preserved them so well that they didn't even smell. And that's when it hit me. This wasn't just some random guy. He wasn't moving because he was dead. A wave of panic rushed over us. We were standing in an empty building with a corpse. What if someone pinned this on us? We did not stick around to find out. Through some mutual friends, we managed to report the body anonymously to the cops. Two days later, we watched as some soldiers clumsily dragged the corpse out in a bag and shoved it into a morgue truck. That should have been the end of it, but curiosity got the better of us. As soon as the cops cleared out, we snuck back to the room. It was exactly as we'd left it, except now the guy was gone. What remained was weird. There were a few candle stubs scattered around, a stack of old speed info magazines, and a torn note book titled, Spells of a Siberian Healer. Turns out, the dead guy wasn't just some random squatter. He was a local weirdo, a bit of an exhibitionist, from what we heard, who'd been known to hang out in that sanatorium. Either he'd had a heart attack, or taken his fetish too far, chasing some kind of thrill he could not handle. Whatever it was, it killed him in the middle of his favorite hobby. On the outskirts of the city, there was this abandoned poultry farm, or at least, that's what it looked like. One time I wandered out there and ran into some stray dogs. They were far off at first, but as soon as they started barking, I did not stick around to see what they did next. I bolted. In one of the big pens, there was this bizarre scene, a shitload of feathers scattered everywhere and hanging from the ceiling, a goat's leg, like someone had been butchering it, but that didn't make any sense. What would a goat be doing on a poultry farm? The locals definitely didn't have any reason to bring one there. I did not find any of her remains either. Just the leg, swinging there on its own. Creepy, right? Another time, I was wandering around an abandoned underground tunnel at night. You know, just scrawling, Anonymous was here on such and such date, on the walls, like any bored idiot would do. While I was doing my thing, I suddenly heard something dripping to my left. I checked it out. Nothing. No puddles. No leaky pipes. Nothing at all. It wasn't even raining as far as I could remember. I moved to the other side of the tunnel, standing to the right of where I'd heard the noise, and once you know it, the dripping sound started up again. But still, there was no water. No source of the sound. Nothing. It doesn't seem all that creepy now, 
just weird as hell. To be honest, I've never come across anything truly terrifying out there. Maybe that's a good thing. When I was 12 or 13, my friends and I discovered a barn in the forest, standing on the overgrown land of a long abandoned house. The house had its own grim history. An alcoholic had lived there, eventually dying alone from a hangover. His body lay there for days, gnawed by rats, and the neighbors had not bothered to bury him. Later, the house burned down, leaving only a pile of charred logs. Even the stove had been scavenged for bricks. The barn, however, was still standing, far from the rest of the village. Just a lonely little structure, at the edge of what used to be a vegetable garden. We loved its seclusion. It became our spot, a hideout where we set up a table, some makeshift seats, and whatever else we could scrounge up. It was perfect for hanging out. The barn itself was small, but it had a tall attic you could reach using a stepladder. The floor on the first level had started to rot, so someone had bolted a huge beam in the center for support. One hot August afternoon, a friend and I headed to the barn to escape the midday sun. We were lounging, sipping lemonade, and playing cards when we suddenly heard footsteps outside. We froze and listened. Nothing. Then, after a while, we heard it again. A faint shuffling sound, like someone walking through the grass. We peeked through the cracks in the barn walls. Nothing. The sound came again, unmistakable now. Figuring it was just some local kids messing with us, I stepped outside to catch them, but there was no one. The area around the barn was mostly open, just some apple trees and dense gooseberry bushes further out. There was nowhere to hide. As soon as I stepped back inside, the shuffling started again. It wasn't scary. Broad daylight, a village nearby, kids everywhere, but it was strange. I told my friend my theory. It had to be some brat playing games. We decided to climb up into the attic and wait, hoping to catch one of them in the act and give them a scare of our own. From the attic, we could see through the cracks in the floorboards and watch for movement below. We waited, tense and silent. A few minutes passed, and then we heard the shuffling again. This is it, I thought, getting ready to pounce. But before we could move, the footsteps stopped. A few seconds of silence stretched out, then suddenly, bam, bam, bam. Someone started chopping at the support beam. The blows came steady and hard, shaking the entire attic. My friend and I stared at each other in shock, frozen. After the fifth or sixth blow, the beam gave away, and the floor collapsed under us. The next thing I knew, I was lying in a pile of broken boards, dust, and rotted wood. Amazingly, we were not hurt, just some bruises and filthy clothes. In a daze, we scrambled to our feet and bolted outside. No one was there. The area around the barn was clear for at least 30 meters and there was no way anyone could have gotten out of sight in the 10 seconds it took us to get out. We circled the barn, checked the bushes, looked in every direction. Still nothing, just the same eerie stillness. We did not go back after that. The barn and the lot slowly grew over with maples, like nature was reclaiming the place. I'd visit occasionally, but I never set foot inside again. To this day, I can't explain it. Maybe it was a prank by some axe-wielding ninja with a cruel sense of humor. But honestly, I doubt it. We checked that beam many times. It was sturdy, easily holding up free people. In the force of those blows, we felt it. And there was no way it broke on its own. That was the last real creepy experience I had in an abandoned place. And I've explored my share of them. Factories, empty houses, half-built structures. Even an old pioneer camp I stayed in one summer. At most, I've run into homeless people, garbage, and thrill-seeking kids, but nothing ever came close to that day in the barn. Abandoned buildings aren't exactly cozy places, except maybe the odd summer cottage someone fixes up for a night's sleep. During my school years in DC too, I lived near two abandoned buildings, an unfinished hospital and an old cinema. Both had their stories. The hospital was a magnet for teenagers, students from the nearby dorms, addicts, and drunks. It was a constant revolving door of chaos. We only ventured there in the evenings, once the grim vibe scared most people off. There wasn't much to do, just empty floors and the occasional homeless person to spook. The cinema, though, was much more intriguing. It was a hulking, gray, 
four-story structure, a boxy coffin of a building. The windows on the first floor were about 2.5 to 3 meters off the ground, making it tough to get in. Our first attempt was through the basement, hoping to find a hatch or stairs up. Instead, we found black corridors filled with trash and abandoned rags. We did not get far. On our next try, we spotted a corner window just big enough to squeeze through. After scrounging a board from a nearby dumpster and leaning it against the wall, we managed to climb inside. The interior was a mix of eerie and fascinating. The lobby had huge glass chandeliers that swayed ominously in the drafts, making it nerve-wracking to walk beneath them. The two cinema halls were pitch dark, with rows of scorched, tattered seats and torn fabric screens. Our foam flashlights barely illuminated a few feet ahead. Behind one of the screens was a rusty iron staircase leading to a platform high above the hall. Ignoring all common sense, we decided to climb up. One friend ventured onto the platform itself, but as soon as he stepped forward, the metal groaned and cracked. In the faint light, we could see his horrified face as the platform gave way. By sheer luck, he managed to grab the railing and scramble back to safety. Shaken, we decided to keep our feet firmly on the ground after that. Above the halls were technical rooms filled with bizarre remnants. One room had iron springs attached to the floor, each holding a concrete slab. It looked like a makeshift trampoline, and of course, we could not resist jumping on it like idiots, roaring with laughter as the whole room shook. Eventually, we stumbled upon a homeless den, a collection of mattresses, pillows, and personal belongings. Thankfully, the occupants were not around, and we decided not to push our luck. We climbed to the roof, where there wasn't much to say apart from the decaying structure. Naturally, we climbed onto the rusted cinema sign anyway, thoroughly terrified the whole time. Later, someone broke open a door to one of the cinema halls, making access easier. But despite the open invitation, the crowds from the hospital did not flock to the cinema. It stayed relatively quiet, and we returned a few times to explore further. The place was littered with old film reels. I even took one as a souvenir. It was some kind of race film, but my mom eventually threw it out, muttering something about the energy of abandoned places. Sadly, the cinema did not last. Fires became frequent, and eventually, part of the second floor collapsed while some teens were exploring. They were either killed or hospitalized, I don't remember exactly. After that, they posted security at the site, and the fun was over. Looking back, the cinema was both thrilling and terrifying. Beyond the fear of the building collapsing, the atmosphere was suffocating. The dark corridors of the second and third floors always seemed alive, rustling, dripping, creaking. Sure, it was just drafts and natural decay, but it created a 10 out of 10 creepy ambience. That was about 10 years ago. I don't live in that area anymore, but I passed by recently. The hospital has been demolished, replaced by a residential complex. The cinema, on the other hand, seems to be under slow reconstruction. It looks lifeless. I still have one frame from that old film reel, saved from my mom's purge. If I find it in my junk pile, I'll share it. Deep in the forest, there is a cluster of abandoned buildings, an eerie mix of architectural eras and styles. Some are old, pre-revolutionary stone houses with crumbling facades, while others are Soviet-era two-story blocks meant for cattle or maybe workers' housing. Scattered among them are the long, brick warehouses, half demolished as if they've been intentionally blown up, and charred wooden sheds, their purpose now forgotten. And then, there is the bunker, a grey, concrete hulk nestled among the ruins, surrounded by the skeletal remains of sheds. The houses are gutted, stripped to the bones, their walls crumbling and precarious. Most are too unstable to explore without risking a collapse. The bunker, though, is a different story. A metal Jacob's ladder descends into its depths, leading to a labyrinth of tiled rooms spread across several floors. The air is cold and heavy, the silence punctuated only by the occasional drip of water. Local legend has it that this place has always been cursed. Under the Tsar, they say it was a hideout for sectarians performing unspeakable rituals. During World War II, it supposedly became an SS headquarters and torture chamber. Under the Soviets, it turned into a secret research institute conducting experiments on prisoners. 
In the late 90s, the place was suddenly sealed off for a week as helicopters circled overhead, smoke rising from the forest. Soldiers guarded the perimeter until, one day, they were gone. Rumors persist that in the bunker, someone found an altar. Supposedly, if you leave an offering there, you can ask for something deeply personal, and the legend warns that your wish may come true, though not necessarily as you intended. The reality, as far as I could uncover, is less dramatic, but no less strange. Official records show the property once belonged to a small research institute focused on soil studies. In the late 90s, it was sold to a dubious private company that also claimed to study soils. The company has long since shut down, and the research institute itself dissolved years ago. Whatever secrets the property held, they were buried with its closure. There were no obvious signs of explosions or fires, just hollowed out warehouses and charred sheds. The buildings looked stripped bare, as though someone systematically removed everything down to the wallpaper. Even the plaster is mostly gone, exposing skeletal wooden beams, scattered remnants, a pair of ancient tarpaulin boots here, a rusted truck wheel there, are the only clues to its past. The bunker is the most puzzling part. Why build such an elaborate network of underground, tiled rooms with twisting corridors and multiple levels? The design suggests something more than soil research, though the purpose remains a mystery. I could not shake the feeling that the bunker was built with secrecy in mind. It's maze-like layout, perfect for keeping prying eyes at bay. Whatever happened here, the stories surrounding this place are as layered and winding as the bunker itself. The buildings stand as a testament to lives and events long forgotten, leaving only speculation. Reminds me of the time some friends and I snuck into an abandoned house. We were crawling around, poking into corners, hoping to find something worth taking. Suddenly, one of the guys shouted, Matanda, and we instinctively scrambled into the attic through a hole in the ceiling. Peeking through the cracks, we saw a military van pull up outside. A group of masked soldiers with machine guns jumped out and started tearing the house apart, clearly looking for us. We could hear them talking. How many are there? Five? They're close, comrade major. Search everywhere, Suyoga. They could not have gone far. In that moment, if someone had jammed a titanium crowbar at my ass, I'd have bitten it into a razor-sharp blade. Luckily for us, they did not think to check the attic and eventually left. The next day, someone burned the house to the ground. Weirdly, the place was empty. Judging by the thick layer of dust, nobody had set foot there for at least a century before we did. Besides the sound of footsteps on crumbled brick in an old store that my friend and I were tearing apart for bricks, there is another strange memory that haunts me. It happened out in the steppe of the Zezkazgan region where I worked as an engineer, building an embankment for a railway. It was a wild, open step, and we were simply following the project to create a trapezoidal embankment for the future tracks. One day, to inspect the area, my friend and I headed toward an old, dilapidated building. Along the way, we passed several long abandoned cemeteries. They were small, about ten graves, maybe, and as I guessed at the time, they were Muslim. There were no crosses or monuments, just sunken graves with faded remnants of what used to be headstones. But that is not the point. Just to know about the forgotten burials that we came across. We kept walking, and the abandoned places grew more distinct. After about five to six kilometers, we spotted some post-Soviet ruins. We wondered what these were doing out in the middle of nowhere. The closer we got, it became clear this wasn't just a small structure. It was a large building, partly underground, with what seemed like at least two floors above ground. We did not feel like exploring the place any further, so we just glanced around at the ruins and the empty landscape, already wanting to turn back, but then we noticed a strange hillock nearby. It stood out because some hidden bricks and concrete were visible at its base. When we climbed up, we found a hatch at the top. I don't remember if there was a lid or if it was open, but it was definitely not closed. Looking down was unnerving, there was no visible bottom. We did not know how deep it went or what was inside, but with just the two of us there, we chickened out, leaving the mystery unsolved. We shrugged and made our way back to the containers where our work camp was set up. Years later, I still wonder what that hatch was about. 
What purpose could it have served? Was it some kind of camouflage structure? Maybe a Soviet storage facility? Or even a refrigerated vault? I don't know how far it went down, and from the outside, it just looked like an ordinary hill near the ruins of a Soviet building. In the middle of the steppe, far from any settlements, I've searched online, but I found nothing that explains it. It would have been terrifying to jump down into that hatch and get stuck there. There was an abandoned place on the edge of our neighborhood. A massive building. Just walking there felt incredibly intense. During the day, my friends and I were not afraid, especially in a group. But after dark, no chance. There wasn't any mist or anything spooky like in the movies. We just made up stories to scare the girls and each other. Years passed. I grew up, and my friends drifted apart. I started going there alone to drink, instead of the forest belt. One night, I decided to test my courage. I went there alone, to see if I could handle it. I went up to the second floor, all the way to the back, and immediately regretted it. The atmosphere was so thick with dread, it felt like you could cut it with a knife. All those stories and fears rushed back to me. I got so worked up, and it felt like a bad dream. Only an idiot would willingly walk into that. But by then, leaving was not an option. The stairs were at the far end of the building, behind a maze of pitch black corridors, and the stairs themselves, they felt like a descent into hell. Just as I was thinking that even the slightest sound might make my heart stop, I heard a noise. At the far end of the room, a figure appeared in the doorway and calmly walked toward the opposite corner. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, but I could not make out any details. For some reason, I thought it was a woman. She stopped there and stood still, blending into the wall. To my surprise, I stayed calm enough to slip out quietly through the dark hallways, and I did not make a sound on my way out. I was shaking when I got home, and I could not sleep until morning. I would not recommend this kind of experiment to anyone whose mind is not prepared for it. The place felt off. You could not explain why, but everyone who went there could feel it. There are abandoned places that feel strangely cozy, places you could even spend the night in. But this place, you don't want to think about it after dark. Like Stephen King said, this room is inhabited by absolute evil. Even though nothing paranormal seemed to happen, it sure felt like it. I like to wander the outskirts of my town, Perdyayeva always on the lookout for new places I have not explored before. About ten years ago, on one such trip, I ended up on the other side of the local forest. The area was so remote and rugged that I began to regret venturing out there, especially alone. It seemed like no human had ever set foot in that wilderness. At least, that is how it felt to me. As I tried to find a path, I came across a rusty fence, behind which was a vast abandoned field, and some buildings in the distance. It was getting close to summer twilight, but I decided to take a look around anyway. It appeared to have once been a stud farm, with several hangars, and a half meter layer of dried manure on the floor. It seemed the place was shut down before I was even born. I was about to leave, when I noticed a house behind some bushes, so I decided to check it out. It looked like a typical one-story house, with tiles, nothing special, but it had clearly been destroyed. The walls were riddled with gunshot marks, the plaster chipped, and everything in the room was scratched up and down. The windows were broken, and the bars on them were twisted, almost as if someone had torn them out with pliers. The door was knocked off its hinges, leaning against the wall beside the entrance. Inside, there was nothing but a stove, a chair, and a table. On the table, there was a Soviet-era newspaper and a full bottle of lemonade. I did not dare to drink it. Yeah, that definitely wasn't lemonade. As I was leaving, I noticed some writing on the side of the fallen door, facing the wall. I flipped the door over and was stunned. The entire surface was covered in fresh black marker, with many desperate messages like, Guys, I beg you, let's come to an agreement. Please, let's talk like men. Why act rashly? Here is my number. And more messages like this just scrawled on the wall. The door itself was hacked up with an axe. It was getting dark, so I hurried to leave. 
As I walked along the dirt road beside the field, a deep voice shouted at me from inside the forest. Hey, fuck. Ooh. Naturally, I was terrified, but life has taught me not to run blindly away from threats. I jumped into the nettles and looked around. The voice repeated from deeper inside the forest, and I instantly regretted being there. From the darkness, six lanterns appeared, heading directly toward me. I could hear them talking, and sometimes they shouted in my direction. It seemed like they were coming for me. Thankfully, the area was thick with underbrush, and I crawled on all floors, making my escape like a bullet. I still have no idea what happened there or why. None of my friends even know these buildings exist. I never went back. According to Google Maps, there is almost nothing left now. Either it's been overgrown, fallen apart, or demolished.